Hello, everyone. This is John Fanning. Happy Friday. Uh, as most of you know, I'm the treasurer for the Greater Houston Business Ethics Roundtable. And um, I'm also the vice president with Integrity Risk, who is today's corporate sponsor. Thank you all for taking the time to join the Gerber Summer Workshop. This is session number five. I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items just to get us started. Um, Everyone is muted, uh, but we want to make this an interactive session. So Q&A is down at the bottom. You can link in and ask questions at any time. Uh, we have reserved some time at the end for to address any questions. And certainly Tom can jump in and, at any point and address them if he wants, but uh, we, will, we definitely will have time to get to your questions. So please do ask. Uh, this will be recorded and the links will be on our website uh, along with any materials that's provided by the speaker. With that, I'll hand it off to Vanessa Rossi, who is the current president of the Greater Houston Business Ethics Roundtable, and she'll get us started and dis discuss a few, few items. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, John, and thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining our final day of our week of webinars. We appreciate your attendance, and I hope you've enjoyed the entire week. And we're going to end it with a bang with Tom Fox. Before Joya, our program chairman, introduces Tom and his topic, I wanted to say thank you again to Integrity Risk International for hosting the webinar. There's a lot of work behind hosting these webinars and we really appreciate it. And I'd like to say a few words about the company of Integrity Risk International. Integrity Risk is a provider of risk management services, including global enhanced due diligence services accompanied by a comprehensive due diligence online portal and supported by a database aggregator and other sophisticated technology tools. They also provide services related to beneficial ownership compliance, wealth intelligence, social media diligence, impact investing, and sustainability diligence. Integrity Risk also provides compliance advisory services in several areas including anti-bribery and corruption and anti-money laundering. Finally, they perform asset inquiries, executive background checks, monitorships, and various safety and security services. They are a comprehensive compliance services vendor, as you can see. And thanks again. I will now turn it over to Joya Williams to introduce our speaker and our topic. Thank you, Vanessa. Good morning, everyone. Today's webinar is called Legal Ethics for the Compliance Practitioner. We are so pleased to close out this week's summer workshop with Tom Fox as our expert speaker on this topic. I really don't feel like Tom Fox needs any introduction, but just in case there's one or two of you on the line who don't know anything about Tom Fox, Tom Fox is the compliance evangelist. Uh, he's little, literally the guy who wrote the book on compliance. Uh, Tom has authored 19 books on business leadership, compliance and ethics, and corporate governance, including international bestsellers, lessons learned on compliance and ethics, and best practices under the FCPA and Bribery Act, as well as his award-winning series on Fox on Compliance. Tom leads the social media discussion on compliance with his award-winning blog, the FCPA Compliance and Ethics blog, and is the voice of compliance. He's uh, having founded the award-winning Compliance Podcast Network. Um, he's also a member of the C-Suite Radio Network. And his uh, email address, if you want to reach out to him, uh, you can contact him on LinkedIn or uh, his email address is tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Now I will turn it over to Tom Fox. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Joya. You're welcome. And uh, thanks to everyone. I'm really thrilled to be here today. It's been a great week of our workshop at Gerber. Uh, people, a couple of people have reached out to me who were just so intrigued with the form of the workshop. And we started this last year uh, because of the pandemic and it's turned into something that I think is very special. And I'm, because of that, I'm just thrilled to, to be able to, to speak at this year's event. Uh, I'm gonna talk about legal ethics. And one reason is 
it turns out to, it's a pretty interesting subject with some uh, interesting questions that I'm going to pose to you and ask you to consider. Point two is if you're a lawyer in the state of Texas, uh, you know, you have to have three hours of legal ethics and that's always difficult to get. So we wanted to try to give you some uh, something special and extra from this week's uh, workshop. And that's uh, one of my roles as well. So we're going to get right into it. What, what are some of the initial uh, legal ethical considerations? Well, I'm going to start with the basics, which is the Texas Lawyer's Creed. A lawyer should always adhere to the highest principles of professionalism. And professionalism requires more than merely avoiding the violation of the uh, laws and rules. Uh, when I prepared this uh, presentation, um, I have to sheepishly admit I hadn't read the Texas Lawyer's Creed for some time. And so I think if, uh, once again, if you're a lawyer in Texas, it's good to refer to this. Uh, and I think it gives us something to feel proud about being a lawyer uh, 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 authorized to practice law in the state of Texas. And if you're like me, uh, you got sworn in by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So uh, it was all a pretty impressive ceremony. And that's where we first learned the lawyer's creed. But there's some additional rules of professional conduct that I'd like to share with you and ask you to consider really throughout your journey as a compliance professional or if you're an in-house legal uh, person as well. So as a lawyer and member of the legal profession, we are representative, is, it's a representative of clients, an officer of the legal system and a public citizen having special responsibility for the quality of justice. In all professional functions, a lawyer should be competent, prompt and diligent. And I'd like to, uh, I've underlined competent because that is uh, its requirement in the state of Texas has now taken that requirement and basically said you must be competent in tech relating to the practice of law. So if you happen to be a lawyer in private practice, if you're a uh, in-house lawyer, uh, you have to be competent as well. The legal profession's relative autonomy carries a special relationship of self-governance. That's why we have the bar basically as, as our policing group group as well. So the ABA rules of professional conduct. We have a duty of competence, a duty of candor, and a duty of fairness. The duty of competence, a lawyer should provide competent representation to a client. Competent representation required the legal knowledge, skill, and thoroughness of preparation reasonably necessary for the representation. What if you are a uh, compliance professional in a corporation. You happen to hold a law license from the state of Texas. You don't quit being a lawyer because you're working in the compliance function, at least in the eyes of the state of Texas. So, uh, and your client is uh, the company you, you work for. So you must provide competent representation to your client, even if that happens to be uh, in the uh, compliance function. Duty of candor. A lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of fact or law to a tribunal or fail to correct a false statement of material fact or law previously made to, a tri to the tribunal by the lawyer or offer evidence that the lawyer knows to be false. Now, this would seem to focus on tribunals, arbitration panels, judges, but it may be extended to uh, when you go in front of the government and there the consequences can be criminal. Uh, in terms of severity, if you make a false statement uh, or fail to correct a statement. So uh, duty of candor is significant. And duty of fairness, a lawyer should not unlawfully obstruct another party's access to evidence or unlawfully alter, destroy, or conceal a document. Or uh, falsify evidence, or knowingly disobey an obligation under the rules of the tribunal. Now I'd like you to think about not being in front of a judge or jury, but take these same obligations in terms of an in-house investigation. Or if you are um, dealing with an internal investigation that you know will be turned over to the government, or if the government has contacted your company and they have requested information and you're a part of the investigation team. So once again, the consequences, if you do any of these to the government, to the FBI, to the Department of Justice, or to state of Texas officials. Um, they can be quite serious and they can be criminal in nature. So uh, keep these uh, in mind, you have these duties as a lawyer, 
whether or not you're in the compliance function. Uh, if you hold a law license, uh, you have these obligations. And when you're dealing with government, then you could be potentially dealing with criminal issues. So ethical duties during internal investigations. And this is an area where uh, it gets interesting. And I think, uh, and I'm going to ask you to think through some things that may appear on the surface to be straightforward, yet um, they may be a little more nuanced than we think. So what are the roles of an in-house counsel in a corporation? I've been in-house counsel uh, in corporations, I've worked in the compliance function in corporations, so I've been the general counsel of a corporation. Well, you are number one, an advocate and trusted advisor for the company. You may represent the company in front of a judge, jury, or other tribunal, but you're also a trusted advisor. And note the word on the end, company. If you've ever been a general counsel, you may have had an experience like I did the first day I went to see the CEO after I began my employment tenure. And he said, welcome, Tom, you're my lawyer and you're here to keep me out of trouble. Well, not quite. I'm the company's lawyer and I was there to keep the company out of trouble. Uh, many CEOs don't quite see it like that. So uh, you are an advocate and trusted advisor for the company. You're the gatekeeper and supervisor of employees regarding legal, ethical, and compliance related issues. Yes, you as a lawyer are a gatekeeper. And you're also, uh, if you're in the compliance function, you're a supervisor of employees regarding uh, a variety of issues. It can be legal, it can be ethical, and it can be compliance related. You're an advisor on business transactions. Obviously, if you're sitting in the general counsel's office, uh, you are probably doing at some point contracts, uh, unless you're in a very large corporation and you're very siloed in terms of your job duties, but it would not be unusual for you to be an advisor on business transactions. Well, how do you sit in your, uh, sit in your silo or stay in your lane? Do you only look at legal issues when you're reviewing contracts? Do you look at any of the commercial or operational terms of a contract? What's your obligations uh, around business transactions? Do you give advice on areas of business transaction which may be operational or business? And what's your role in that? Um, certainly your role would be to advise on legal issues in business transactions, but what happens when your role blends over or bleeds over to more commercial advice? Um, you could be responsible for conducting internal investigations. We're gonna take a little bit um, deeper dive into this in a minute, but uh, certainly as a lawyer, uh, you may be the first person uh, to handle an internal investigation for your company. You may be a part of a team that handles it. You may be a part of a group working with outside counsel on a major investigation. So uh, you, could, you could have one or more hats that you would wear regarding internal investigations. And you're responsible for other ancillary business functions, uh, business advice, communications, PR. You may be asked to write P, uh, PR statements. You may be asked to write business communication statements. Uh, and here I would point you to uh, just yesterday, the horrible tragedy we had in Miami with uh, the building collapse. And uh, the lawyer for uh, the agent management uh, company for that apartment complex, he was the one giving the PR statements. Query should uh, general counsel be doing that. Nevertheless, they made the decision that that was the best route for them to take. So you may be asked to, uh, to step in front of the cameras in, in, and in the face of a catastrophic event. <clears throat> Is that something that uh, you're ready for? So you, as an investigator, you actually have several roles and I detailed these. Um, you may have, all of these roles, or you may have one or more of these roles. Uh, but in thinking through your role as an investigator to determine whether and when to be begin an investigation. So say a report comes in through your hotline, say the report comes in because you have a speak up culture and a supervisor is, talk, is told something by an employee and they call you and you have to triage that and determine whether 
and when to begin an investigation. If you're in a US public company, you know the clock is running on investigations. You basically have 120 days uh, to be in the SEC's good graces. And if you don't make an initial determination within that 120 days, the uh, SEC may, just, may conclude that your compliance and investigative function is not functioning and that the corporation is not really concerned about doing things in a timely manner. So you have to be able to triage. You have to be able to take what may be an anonymous report, what may be a report with less facts than, than you really think you need. Um, and you may have to uh, have a, begin an investigation. Uh, I would hope that you would have an investigation protocol so you don't have to think through this each time, but uh, that initial step is, is critical. Obviously conducting the investigation is something. If you have ever worked in-house, you've probably conducted some types of investigations. That investigation could be, and in my experience, was as straightforward as someone uh, lying or cheating on their expense accounts, all the way to potential bribery and corruption in overseas business operations, and really everything in between. So um, you, you could have to conduct a wide variety of investigations, and if it's in the area of, the, of law that you don't know, uh, my only suggestion is by the time you begin your investigation, you need to know that area of the law. Uh, once a lawyer, always a lawyer. And if you are a solo uh, general counsel or in a one or two person legal department or a one or two person compliance department, uh, you may be asked to handle a wide variety of issues. Uh, so you have to be ready to conduct an investigation uh, it could be environmental, it could be antitrust, it could be conflicts of interest, it could be money laundering, it could be export control, it could be corruption. So you have to be ready to conduct an investigation. Uh, if the investigation is serious, or rather the issue is serious enough, you're also going to have to report to senior executives. Uh, it can get dicey when there may be senior executive involvement. Uh, if you've, I hope you haven't had situation where you had to investigate the CEO, that is, uh, can be a very difficult experience. It can be a career limiting experience, um, but you may have to do that because remember the CEO is not your client, the company is your client, but you may have to report to people who actually determine your compensation. So is that a potential conflict of interest? Perhaps, but it's something that you want to may uh, think through. And then finally, reporting to government agencies and producing information. If you are in a situation where your company has been contacted by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the FTC, the uh, uh, Department of Justice, or any of the other US agencies, I would hope you would retain uh, outside counsel who, can, uh, who have specific uh, expertise in the area that you've been asked to report to. Uh, and using those channels, but you may be the point person in your organization for uh, providing information, uh, producing information to outside counsel. Outside counsel may ask you to be a part of a <clears throat> team that goes to make an in-person presentation, and you really have to be uh, ready for all of those. I should have added in reporting to senior executives, that can also include reporting to the boards of directors. And uh, with reporting to either the boards or senior executives, sometimes you need to determine what's the best method to report. So do you put together a lengthy report? Do you put together a short form report? Do you put together a PowerPoint presentation? Do you simply make an oral presentation? Uh, you have to consider all of those factors. So what are your duties as an investigator? as a, a lawyer, in-house lawyer, or lawyer in private practice retained to uh, investigate. One, obviously you have to investigate, but more than that, you have to determine the scope and you have to determine who should investigate. So is that in-house counsel or is that outside counsel? And this determination can be critical. Uh, we're gonna go through both of those in-house and outside counsel options in a minute. But let me back up to determining the scope. And I talked about this in the last slide in the context of triage, uh, but determining the scope of the investigation is absolutely critical. 
<clears throat> I mentioned the timeline from the Securities and Exchange Commission. That comes to us from uh, Sarbanes Oxley and Dodd Frank, where uh, particularly uh, Dodd Frank, there is an aggressive whistleblower position, uh, provision rather, <clears throat> which protects whistleblowers from retaliation. But more importantly, if a whistleblower goes to the Securities and Exchange Commission and uh, you find out about it, your, your response is not to try to unmask the whistleblower. Your response is to try to determine if there are going to be merits to these allegations, <clears throat> because if you don't do something to investigate, and if there's something there and you don't stop it, well, the Securities and Exchange Com Commission is going to uh, take the inference that not only did you know about it, but you didn't care enough to stop about it. And if it's illegal conduct, you're going to get in much worse position with the Securities and Exchange Commission. <clears throat> so determining the scope is absolutely critical. And that means you have to put some amount of time into your triage. You may have to reach out to the reporter or the whistleblower to garner more information. If they're anonymous, uh, you may have to, to try to do so in a, in a manner that protects their anonymity. But we've had a couple of cases literally where the CEO has attempted to unmask the whistleblower because the CEO thought the allegations were so outrageous <clears throat> that they couldn't be true and it was just a slander. Well, a CEO can't do that. And you should not allow a CEO to do that. And in, in, in both situations, the CEO was filed, it was in the United Kingdom and they were fined hundreds of millions of pounds. So uh, regulators take this seriously. So to investigate, let me move this. Uh, you have to make a reasonable and appropriate inquiry into whether or not a violation of law occurred. Obviously, the triage starts you off, but then you have to figure out, is this a violation of the law? If there is a violation of law, this is something that needs to be escalated up uh, through the general counsel's office, probably. It could go to senior executives, or you could go directly to the board of directors. If you're in the compliance function and you're a chief compliance officer, I hope you have direct access to the board of directors, whether it be the audit committee, the chair of the audit committee or the chair of the board. But uh, if there is a violation of law, that should immediately set you off on a path of uh, internal reporting so that you uh, can get the information to the decision makers around a self-disclosure. A self-disclosure is in many ways, or perhaps the most difficult decision a board may have to make. Obviously a self-disclosure is uh, it can be an expensive proposition. It can open the company up to potential fines and penalties, and it can open the company up to a US public company may have to report uh, it's investigating potential violation of law. And if that happens, you can bet your bottom dollar that the plaintiff's bar and the shareholder derivative lawsuit world will glom onto that and to uh, uh, maybe facing a shareholder lawsuit as well. So, say I have a question, but I can't seem to open it right now. So, I have to wait on that. So, um, make a reasonable inquiry uh, into whether or not a violation of law has occurred. Joya, can you read the question I'm seeing in QA? I sure can, Tom. It, the question is what are the main reasons to work with outside counsel on an investigation? When would you engage them and when would you not? Okay, well, we're gonna take that up in a specific slide. So thanks for the question and we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Uh, next, uh, determining the credibility of an allegation. Uh, credibility is gonna be key. It starts with the witnesses, but don't, don't get uh, uh, caught up in thinking, well, I'm gonna be able to sit down with a witness and whether it's old days, old school, in person, or on a Zoom call, and I'll be able to determine the uh, credibility of the allegations. It's typically backed up by documents or not. If there's an allegation and there's a document trail or an evidentiary trail, that can go a long way to determining the credibility of an allegation. 
I'm one who believes that you have to, as an investigator, have full knowledge of all of the documents before you begin your in-person investigations. Further, as an investigator, you have to know the documents inside and out, backwards and forwards, better than every witness. So if a witness says something that is inconsistent with what you know to be the documentary evidence, that you can pull that document out and say, please help me understand what you just said. You said, A, this document says Z, uh, can you help me reconcile that? Uh, because the documents are gonna be the most important and most persuasive evidence, whether, uh, whether you're in front of a judge or jury or whether you're sitting across the table from the Department of Justice. So um, determining the credibility of an allegation, I think starts with putting a document hold in place, getting the documents and then reviewing the documents and seeing if <clears throat> there is a reasonable possibility or reasonable expectation that there is a credibility of an allegation. And remember, uh, it's not simply reading and accessing the documents, it could be the lack of documents. So that if there is a hole in the documents that should have been there, that could tell you that someone is perhaps manipulating your document management system or somehow uh, over uh, running around and uh, uh, subverting your or overriding your uh, internal controls. And then uh, after you make some determinations on the credibility, conducting a preliminary inquiry and assessment, <clears throat> After you uh, become the expert on the documents regarding the allegation, you determine that the uh, allegation is credible and you move forward to investigate, uh, you make this preliminary inquiry, but it doesn't end there because you have to assess. Now, uh, this can be somewhat tricky because um, of the difference between reporting facts and assessing blame. In another life, uh, I was a trial lawyer. And as a trial lawyer, I represented chemical and petrochemical plants in uh, the Texas Gulf Coast. And every time there was an accident, I mean, every time, there was an, an investigation and a root cause analysis. This was not done by lawyers. This was done by plant guys and gals. If it was a unionized environment, it would be half union, <coughs> half uh, management. And they were there to do an investigation and more importantly, a root cause analysis. And the reason was they didn't want the accident to happen again and someone else potentially get hurt. So they were there to figure out what happened, who screwed up, how they screwed up, and uh, was there something that could be put in place to prevent this from happening again. And they were told, and indeed it was beat into their head, report facts, don't assess blame. <clears throat> and they were great at that. A couple of times when I had to go to trial and I took those reports literally done by plant guys uh, who said, this is what happened. This is how it happened. And this is why it happened. And this is the remedy we engaged in. <clears throat> and it went against the plaintiff. Well, I won those cases. That's the power of reporting facts not assessing blame, but you as the lawyer or you as a chief compliance officer, general counsel, or a compliance professional in the legal department, you may be asked to, to do an assessment. So uh, you have to, to kind of keep those two separate in your mind. <clears throat> if you're asked to assess blame, certainly make that assessment. If you're asked to do a root cause analysis, certainly do a root cause analysis. But your role may be simply to report the facts. And uh, reporting the facts can be a part uh, or can include that you um, determine that the allegation is valid, the documents support the allegation, and the person who's uh, accused is not telling me the truth. That, that can be a factual report. <clears throat> but be cognizant of reporting facts and assessing blame. Doesn't necessarily mean they're in conflict. Same person can do it. But if you're asked to do it, be aware of that. Okay, determining scope. So here, uh, many of us work, work or have worked at multinational organizations, particularly in the uh, energy space, where we 
um, have business units literally across the world. And we have a, a business unit in every region, say perhaps Antarctica. Uh, so uh, focus on regions, key departments and individuals. So I always tried to think through as kind of like a funnel, what region to what department to what were the key individuals and narrow that down. And then what would a relevant government agency expect? Um, so from the FCPA, uh, original 2012 FCPA resource guide, efficient, reliable, and properly funded process with proper documentation of company responses. So <clears throat> determine the scope. Uh, we, we have several government members who have done this on a regular basis. I don't know if they're on this uh, event or not today, but uh, put together your plan and then execute on that plan. Okay, now we're moving in to answer, begin to answer uh, the question that was posed to us by our listener today of who to determine who should investigate. So here are some of the questions that I would ask you to consider. What is the nature of the conduct in question? Is it a ethical violation? Is it a violation of the code of conduct? Is it a violation of a policy and procedure? Um, is it a legal violation? What was the duration of the con conduct? Is it a one-off? What about a, a fraud that's perpetrated on the company by employee or employees where over the course of some months or even years, they've actually stolen money from the company or been able to purloin it in a way that they've been able to get to it? Who is involved? Uh, is it uh, a business unit overseas? If so, does it go to the head of the business unit? Does it go to the uh, regional VP? Does it go to the country manager? What's your possible financial exposure? And here I would ask you to consider not simply the money that you've lost or your company lost rather, but what's the potential financial exposure uh, from a regulator? Is there a fine and penalty? If you self-disclose, what's your potential fine and penalty? Because that's something that you certainly have to consider. Additionally, I mentioned a shareholder lawsuit that in this day and age, that I wouldn't say is 100% certainty, but it's a very high certainty or a very high percentage. Are there criminal implications? Uh, talked about that a little bit throughout this presentation, but uh, certainly under uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, has there been a bribe paid or an offer to pay a bribe? I, I recently was in the situation where it was an allegation, an offer to pay a bribe had been made, but there was no evidence that a bribe had been paid. Nevertheless, that can be uh, under the FCPA and offer <clears throat> is the same as paying a bribe. So what are the potential criminal implications? What about antitrust implications? Uh, many of us in the energy industry, if you've ever worked overseas, you know that US expats tend to hang around together. And every time I would go to a barbecue, uh, at that time I worked at Halliburton, there'd be a place from Weatherford, there'd be a place from Baker Hughes, and back then it was uh, BJ Services. So there was, uh, uh, are there any antitrust implications? Uh, we all flew home together at the same times, you know, that sort of thing. So um, you have a wide variety of issues that you may uh, have to face. And then who could be harmed by the misconduct? Obviously your company could be harmed by the misconduct, but what about others? Uh, we've had a couple of situations, certainly in the FCPA world, where companies have filed suit and recovered millions of dollars in damages from companies that paid bribes to get contracts so that they illegally got contracts when other companies uh, were in line to get those. And so you had unfair business practices lawsuits, essentially state law claims. So who could be harmed by the misconduct or could your shareholders be harmed by the misconduct? <clears throat> those sorts of things as well. Now, uh, why should an in-house counsel investigate? And then our, I think in our next slide, we're gonna look at reasons to go outside. Number one, familiarity with senior management operations and policies. Uh, if you are a general counsel, if you're a chief compliance officer, or you work in those functions, you uh, hopefully will be familiar with senior management. If you're not, personally, you can get a quick introduction, but you're probably gonna be more familiar with your company's operations and your policies and procedures. So that familiarity can really help you initially understand what the 
claims are and perhaps in what business units they uh, came up in and how those businesses, business units are actually conducting business. Two, you understand the company risk areas or you should understand the company risk areas. And if you're in the compliance space, I hope you understand the company's risk areas because risk management is a critical area for compliance, but the same's true from the legal department perspective as well. What are the areas that the company is at the highest risk, operational risk, compliance risk, legal risk, um, one of the interesting types of risks that arose about starting about five years ago is regime change risk. And I don't mean that I'm saying bomb them out of existence regime change. I mean, democratically elected regime change. Uh, we certainly had that in the United States last year, but we had that in Brazil. We had it in South Africa. Uh, we've had it in uh, other countries where in, in Africa, where a new regime comes in and uh, they want to look at the deals of all of their predecessors. Um, <clears throat> employees. Employees may or may not be more forthright with a colleague. It could be uh, difficult if your friends perhaps sit across from the table and put your lawyer hat on and interview someone. But uh, on the other hand, they may be willing to share more information with you. <clears throat> they may be more willing to or be comfortable with you. And this may give you an ability to get more information more quickly. And certainly uh, going in-house or using in-house resources can be cost effective. Uh, unfortunately, in the FCPA world, uh, the top lawyers now are at $1,500 an hour. Well, it doesn't take very long for that to, to go up, particularly when you have a big law firm staffing up for a full investigation. So uh, going in-house certainly can be more cost effective. Now, some of the reasons for outside counsel to investigate uh, <clears throat> may be perceived as more objective by outside agencies. And this is uh, something that I think the Department of Justice focuses on, particularly if it's a significant investigation or at least a significant allegation of potential illegal conduct is you have more act objectivity from outside um, uh, large from private practice because they will be more forthright uh, with senior executives and boards of directors because their salary is not being paid by those groups. So it could be perceived as more objective by outside agencies. You can select having a council of a focused practice area regarding the issue at hand. So uh, say you get a letter from the CFTC or the CFPB or the FTC, uh, those those might be subspecialties of the law that you as a general counsel really haven't focused on, but you need some guidance into a very technical area of the law so that you can get some very specialized counsel to help you. Uh, number three, uh, many law firms now, and I would say for about the last 10 years, <clears throat> have built out significant white collar defense practice areas. So they'll have a team and strong bench of employees or rather partners and associates with significant investigative experience. They may be uh, uh, experienced in uh, Africa, Asia, uh, you name the country or geographic region. They can have a subject matter expertise, but they can have also a significant investigative experience and that should not be discounted and, and can be uh, very helpful to you if it's a serious matter. Next, they may have a relationship with government agency personnel. So for instance, when someone leaves the Department of Justice Fraud Section FCPA unit, uh, they cannot negotiate with their former colleagues for a year, but after one year, you may hire them and they may be sitting across the table from someone they used to supervise or someone that supervised them or someone who is their colleague. And that relationship uh, may buy you some credibility because <clears throat> If you talk to, and I've talked to a lot, any uh, significant private practice lawyer, they will tell you the most significant thing they bring and the most significant thing you can have in the government's eyes is credibility. Credibility that the documents are tied down, credibility that the right documents are turned over to the government, credibility that they're even if an investigation is ring-fenced, 
to a specific geographic area or business unit, it's gonna be a thorough investigation. And that relationship is not to be discounted. And frankly, if I was a general counsel or a chief compliance officer and I uh, thought there was, a, <coughs> excuse me, an FCPA violation, you bet I would hire someone who had come out of the fraud section or had come out of the FCPA unit because I want that specific experience. I'm always practicing on the civil side of things. I'm not an ex-criminal guy. I've never been a prosecutor. It's a different mentality. It's kind of a different set of nuanced uh, facts or rather regulations. And I think that is an invaluable tool for you to use as an in-house practitioner utilizing outside counsel to investigate. And finally, time. You as a general counsel, you as a chief compliance officer, or you in one of those corporate functions, you only have so much time. And of course, you have your day job. And uh, it may be difficult for you to devote as much time as you need to doing your day job and an investigation. Obviously, outside counsel doesn't have that problem. <clears throat> if you want a team of lawyers or you want a lawyer dedicated to something full time, you say, this is what I want. Now, now, I recognize there's cost to that and financial cost to that, but if that's what you need, you can get that resource. And that is clearly a beauty of outside counsel. So these are some of the things that I would ask you to think about and some of the reasons that you might want to stay in house or you might want to uh, go outside. Uh, reporting up the ladder. <clears throat> you have, remember, you have a duty to inquire into an issue before you have actual knowledge of uh, a legal violation and who you're going to report this to. Are you going to report it in-house? You're going to report it to a higher authority or are you going to go outside? And that brings us to the model rules of professional conduct. I'm not going to read this because I've pulled out in the next couple of slides uh, some of the key things that you need to consider. So uh, officer, employee, or other association associated person has acted or intends to act, if their action will likely result in substantial industry, injury, excuse me, it's in the best interest of the organization, you as a lawyer shall refer the matter to a higher authority. So this means if you're aware something's about to happen, you need to get that up to people higher in the organization. Now, what happens if that highest authority refuses to take appropriate action? <clears throat> well, the model rules say, if a lawyer reasonably believes the violation is re, uh, reasonably certain to result in injury to the organization, a lawyer may reveal the information uh, relating to their representation, only to the extent to prevent substantial industry injury to the organization. Uh, but that, that could be a criminal fine, that could be a criminal penalty, it could put uh, the company at risk for civil penalties as well. So the model rules of professional conduct allow you to the mandate you to take up an issue up the chain and actually go outside the company if a uh, company won't do that, uh, do something about it. Multiple representations. Texas Discipline Rules of Professional Conduct says the lawyer may represent two or more clients if that representation will not materially affect the representation and both clients are informed. So what happens if you represent employees and the corporation? What represents representations do you make to them? Do you disclose to them the potential conflict of interest and do you allow them to get their own counsel if they want to? <clears throat> Corporate Miranda warnings. This is becoming a little more uh, discussed in the literature because what happens if an investigation occurs, <clears throat> comments or uh, uh, allegations are substantiated or uh, admissions are made and um, those admissions go to the government in the form of an internal report, and then that employee is then uh, either civil or criminally prosecuted. Um, so and a corporation can assert the attorney-client privilege, but employees cannot. So Upjohn, if you are in the corporate world at all, I hope you've heard of Upjohn. It's required for every lawyer doing an investigation to uh, indicate to the person being interviewed <clears throat> that the lawyer represents the corporation and does not represent the uh, interviewee personally. Uh, this is an approved Upjohn warning. So if you need one uh, uh, or Upjohn letter, you can cut and paste this 
I read this out at every interview. I uh, asked to have the witness sign it. So there's no question that the Upjohn warning was given. Uh, if that person is not a native English speaker, I'd have that translated into their native language. Uh, this protects you because there can never be a claim by the person going forward that they were thought they were being protected by the attorney-client privilege if you give an appropriate Upjohn warning. What about Miranda warnings? I started to talk about that um, a little bit. What, but what are the implications for self-disclosure uh, to the Department of Justice? If you're doing an investigation, uh, do you know it's gonna be turned over to the DOJ? Do you suspect? What about if the, you have been contacted or previously by the DOJ or previously self-disclosed to the DOJ? Your investigation is based upon an approved investigation plan to the Department of Justice. Um, does that make you basically deputize you as a federal investigator? Um, I have to say it could be an open question at this point. We've had one case, Rose Carson and CCI, where Rose Carson was heading to an interview, an internal investigation headed by outside counsel on her way to the interview. She destroyed documents in a ladies restroom and went to the interview and she was charged with federal destruction of uh, 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 witness tampering, the destruction of documents. That charge was later dropped, but it's still one example that in a civil investigation with private parties doing the investigation, a witness was charged with a federal crime of uh, destroying documents. Do you have a duty as either an in-house lawyer or an outside counsel uh, to disclose any of this? Because remember, Miranda warnings are typically only given after someone's arrested and uh, your internal investigation usually happens before that time. So we're nearing the end and um, I wanted to bring up the case of Wadler versus BioRat. This is a case where a general counsel of a company um, blew the whistle on his own company. He believed that the company was engaging in FCPA violations outside the United States and um, took it to the board of directors who did nothing with it. And then he went to the feds with it and he was fired for that. So he was retaliated for being a whistleblower and he brought <clears throat> a retaliation uh, claim and he was successful at trial. So that showed us number one, a general counsel can violate the attorney client privilege when there's a, a good faith belief of illegal conduct. Uh, Attorneys are covered by Sarbanes-Oxley and uh, Dodd-Frank, and that uh, if an attorney is fired after the whistleblowing, then the company can be liable for damages. So this was a huge case. <coughs> Excuse me. He was awarded, I think, $15 million. It was reduced a little bit, but a very significant case of Wadler versus BioRat. And finally, the AML law of 2020, passed January 1, 2021. Uh, this was the bill that uh, the National Defense Authorization Act where uh, Congress overrode the president's veto. It included an update to uh, Bank Secrecy Act and other AML laws. Uh, for the purposes of our discussion though, the whistleblower prote protection specifically listed lawyers. So now we have a law which says lawyers, in-house lawyers, private practice lawyers, uh, lawyers uh, who are in the compliance function, all uh, can be whistleblowers and they do have a retaliation protection. Um, I think this is probably one of the most nuanced and difficult areas <clears throat> that we as lawyers are going to face because we've been taught literally all our lives since law school about the sanctity of the attorney-client privilege and more importantly, the confidentiality a lawyer has with any client's information. But that's changing now. And if you as a lawyer feel like your company's not taking it seriously uh, and you've reported it internally, you will have whistleblower protection going forward. I know at this point, Julia loves to ring that bell. So uh, as I learned yesterday from just and I don't want to hear that bell. So uh, I'm going to uh, pitch it back to Joya at this point. Joya, I, I saw a couple of questions came in. Once again, I can't seem to open them. Could you give them to me? 
Thank you, Tom. Yes, uh, John. Hi, John Joy. Manning will uh, handle the questions. Thank you, John. <laughs> hey, thank you, Tom. That was great. Um, there are a couple of questions. Uh, one, one came um, from, we've got one here that is asking if fact witnesses need to sign the Upjohn or just potential targets of the investigation. Uh, for fact witnesses, uh, is it is providing up John verbally and noting the case file, their agreement to proceed enough? Uh, I would say you always want to get a signed document because that's going to be the strongest evidence <clears throat> that you've given the up John warning uh, and it's been acknowledged. Uh, there's no difference between a fact witness and someone who may be under suspicion or some other type of witness. It is critical that you let the witness know you're not representing them. The best way to do so is through a written uh, document that you've read to them. They acknowledge they have received it. Hopefully they've understood it and that they're willing to proceed. If you can't get them to sign it, the next best thing is to note in your report <clears throat> that the Upjohn warning was given and that the witness uh, declined to sign the uh, form. Great. Well, great. And, uh, and then, Tom, what are your thoughts on recording investigations? There's another question. So um, two schools of thoughts, really. One is that um, actually you should ha have someone with you in an interview to take notes so that you as the interviewer are not really focused on having to take notes and you can focus on what the witness says, what their demeanor is, all of the things that we were taught and we did before COVID-19. Um, so that's sort of point one. Uh, I think it's more important to record an interview uh, post COVID or at least after we've gone into COVID because I've seen several interviews that have been done uh, via <clears throat> virtual, whether Zoom or, or Skype or, or some other platform. And I haven't really been able to get a sense of their body language or their demeanor in the interview. So I find it to be extraordinarily more helpful to record the interview over when you have to do the interview virtually. But I would be in favor of uh, <clears throat> recording the interview. I do acknowledge that that intimidates some witnesses if you're there present and you slap a recorder down. Great, thanks Tom. Um, we've got a couple more questions and we'll get to both of these. Are there ways to safeguard against conflicts of interest, maybe in reporting structure or contract language that would help related, um, help related to conducting an investigation involving the CEOs or CEO or others who impact your employment? So there are ways to do that, but it really starts with your employment contract and who's reviewing and assessing your conduct or you're evaluating you rather, and then setting your compensation. So that uh, if you don't do that before the investigation comes up, you're gonna really be in a diff difficult position to change that if you have to investigate a CEO. If the board of directors or the audit committee of the board handles that, uh, and that's written into your employment contract or, or to someone other than the people you're reviewing or you're investigating uh, because of the reporting structures in your organization. Say you're not the general counsel or not the chief compliance officer, you're below those levels. Uh, then uh, once again, that, that would be the best or better. But if you're the GC or CCO and the CCO, CEO reviews and set your compensation, and then you have to investigate them, that, that could potentially be problematic. Very good, very good. Um, the next question, uh, final question is, do you know uh, much about the new whistleblower directive in Europe? And can you speak to that? And is there any advice on how companies can prepare to meet those requirements? Sure, a uh, new whistleblower uh, directive in Europe goes live December 17, 2021. In addition to providing the uh, standard and a retaliatory protections that I think most of us are aware of here in the United States, the big difference, and I mean humongous difference, is companies have to affirmatively prove they are not discriminating or retaliating against whistleblowers. Question, how do you do that? Well, that means you have to be able to use data to show 
what happened to whistleblowers in the past and what's happening to this whistleblower. <clears throat> Most companies are not set up to do that and they're gonna have to re, uh, reimagine how to present affirmative evidence that you have not discriminated against in hiring, in firing, in um, promotions and discipline in any other way, whistleblowers. It's gonna be a very big challenge and if you haven't started on that, I would suggest you start thinking about how to do that. And if someone wants to talk about that further, I'm, I'm happy to you know, continue this dialogue because it is a big challenge, but it's gonna be extraordinarily important. And once again, uh, if something comes along in Europe, don't be too surprised if that law <coughs> uh, migrates over here to the United States, whether in state law or some sort of federal law form going forward. Excellent. Well, thank you, Tom. That concludes our Q&A section. Um, and I will hand it off to Joya to wrap things up. Thank you, John. One moment here. Here I am. Thank you again to our speaker, Tom Fox, for this insightful webinar today. Thank you again to John Fanning, uh, with Integrity Risk International for sponsoring our workshop platform this week. And thank you again to the Gerber directors. The recording and the slides will be posted on the Gerber website next week. The Texas Bar CLE has approved hours for our summer workshop uh, with today's webinar being approved as an ethics hour. Uh, the course information will be posted on our website you will have to report your own uh, as Gerber does not report hours to the bar for attendees. That concludes today's webinar. Thanks again, everyone, for joining this week. Make it a great weekend, and we will see you soon. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you, Joya. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.